here are the five best and five worst feats in D&D. Warcaster. Welcome to Value Town. Warcaster does three things and they're all amazing. One, you have advantage on your concentration checks, so you are way less likely to lose your powerful spells in combat. People take the resilient feats just to pretty much get this effect. Two, you can perform the somatic components of spells even if you have a shield or a weapon in that hand. You can cast the shield spell while holding a shield. Wizard fighter multiclasses just went through the roof. You could be in heavy armor with a shield and a staff and be firing out spells like a magical tank. Three, when a creature's movement provokes an opportunity attack from you, you can use your reaction to cast a spell at that creature rather than attacking them. The spell has to have a casting time of an action and only target that creature. Do you know what's better than casting power word kill? Casting power word kill as a reaction. Chad spellcasters like druids love this feat, and pretty much any spellcaster is gonna get good value out of at least two of its effects. Lightly armored. Now I know what you're thinking, how bad can this feat really be? It gives you a plus one to dexterity, and it gives light armor proficiency to classes that don't already have it. Well, for a start, that means it's useless for every class in the game except for monks, sorcerers, and wizards. Monks get unarmored defense, and the spellcasters get Mage Armor. Mage Armor sets your AC to 13 plus dexterity. The best non-magical light armor in the game is Studded Leather, which only has an AC of 12 plus dexterity. But let's big brain here. What if you actually find some plus two Studded Leather Armor, a very rare magic item? Well, by taking this feat and wearing it, you're essentially raising your AC by one in that niche instance. Except, do you know what else could have boosted your AC by one? Just put Putting the freaking ability score increase you gave up to take this feat into dexterity, that does the exact same thing and boosts your initiative and your dex saving throws and a ton of skills, and it means the bard or rogue in the party can have the armor you found, which was definitely intended for them, not for you. You are worthy of love. Never trust the voice in your head that says you should take the lightly armored feat. Polar Master. This bad boy can fit so many goddamn combos in it. So Polar Master works with glaives, halberds, quarterstaffs, and spears. And when you take the attack action with that weapon, you can make a bonus action attack with the butt of the weapon, but it only deals 1d4 damage. Extra attacks are extra attacks, that's great. But what's even better is that when an enemy enters your reach while you hold a polearm, you can use a reaction to attack them. This combos amazingly with the sentinel feat, which says when you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, its movement speed falls to zero. So a creature runs up trying to tear your face off, you bop them with your pole arm from 10 feet away, and they can no longer move. That means they can't reach you, and on your next turn you can retreat and do the whole thing again. This is monstrously strong in 1v1 combat, but even without that combo, Polar Master is really good, and it forms part of arguably the strongest level 1 build in the game, the Pole Dancing Barbarian. Video is up here if you want to check that out. Weapon Master. I can't believe this is only the fourth worst feat in the game. Weapon Master gives you a plus one to either strength or dex, which is a good start. It then gives you proficiency with four weapons of your choice. Okay, so here's the thing. Every class already gets every weapon proficiency that they need. The only potential use for this is for a custom lineage monk to grab this feat at level one, grabbing proficiency with the longsword and rounding their dexterity score up to 18. Then at level two, you can make the longsword your dedicated weapon and you've upgraded your D6 short sword into a D8 longsword. If that sounds bad, it's because it is. The issue is that even in the incredibly niche circumstances where you do need another weapon proficiency, you can just be one of the many amazing races that give you weapon proficiencies for free. Any dwarf, any elf with the new trance ability, the Githyanki, there's too many to list. But the ultimate hilarious insult is that Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, the official book, recommends taking this feat on your fighter your fighter, who already has proficiency with every martial weapon. Yeah, this feat is terrible. Oh God, what's this? Yo, dude, what's up? What are you doing? You said we were playing D&D &D with spirits tonight. I've been on the vodka, but it's 
Barely affected me. No, I said we'd be playing with the Book of Spirits, the new expansion for D&D. What? It's a Kickstarter with over seven classes and species, over 50 spirit creatures you can befriend or fight, over 30 new spirit boons and banes. Oh my god, I need it! It's got a whole new rules expansion too. Resonance, a symbiotic mechanic based on dramatic roleplay. Ten spiritual environments, eleven premium minis, and a full original soundtrack. That's amazing! Oh, I'm gonna throw up. It's even got a whole new class, the Conduit, letting you fuse with spirits and unleash mystic powers. <laughs> I'm unleashing my mystic powers. Nah, dude, you're unleashing vomit right now. Ugh, whatever. Let's play. Cross the veil into the spirit realm with the beautiful Book of Spirits. Enter a realm of magic, explore incredible character options, and expand your game with inspiring new mechanics. Bring the spirit realm to your world. Back now on Kickstarter, link in description. Prodigy. Race exclusive feats can be really cool. Spoiler alert, this one is not cool. Prodigy is exclusively available to humans, half-orcs, and half-elves, and all it does is grab you proficiency in a tool, proficiency in a skill, expertise in a skill, and a new language. For a start, nobody cares about grabbing a feat to learn languages and tools. That's what your background is for. But expertise in a skill? That is really good. The problem is, you would never take Prodigy because the feat Skill Expert exists. Skill Expert does the exact same thing as the important part of Prodigy, and it gives you a plus one to any stat, and anyone can take it. Fellas, we just solved racism. Look, there are a few feats that suck in D&D. A linguist, keen mind, stuff you're basically never gonna use. They are definitely trash, but at least they give you a plus one to your stats, anybody can take them, and maybe they give you something to roleplay or work with your character identity. But Prodigy doesn't even do that. Never take this one. Fae Touch. There are a bunch of awesome initiate spells in D&D that basically serve to give you some free spells. Magic Initiate, Artificer Initiate, Shadow Touched, even the underrated Aberrant Dragon Mark. But the best of all of them is Fade Touched. For a start, you get a plus one to your intelligence, charisma, or wisdom. Then you learn the spell Misty Step, which is an absolute powerhouse second level option, letting you teleport 30 feet as a bonus action. But wait, you also get a first level spell from the Enchantment or Divination Schools of Magic, and there's some great options here. Charm Person, Bless, Bane, even Silvery Barbs. You can only cast it once per long rest for free, but if you're a spellcaster, you can cast it with your normal spell slots too. This would be a solid feat if all it did was give you the spells. That plus one to your stats pushes it to god tier. There isn't a build in the game, except maybe some barbarians, where this feat isn't fantastic. Dungeon Delver. Oh, why did they have to waste such a cool name on such a garbage feat? Let's break this down. You have advantage on perception and investigation checks to find hidden doors. That sounds not terrible until you remember that any party of two or more can get advantage on investigation or perception checks at any time to find anything by just taking the help action. Then you have advantage on avoiding traps and avoiding damage from traps. Look, real talk, I've DM'd and run like thousands of games of D&D. I think this would have been relevant maybe six times in all those games? Finally, traveling at a fast pace doesn't impose a minus five to your perception, which is technically an upside, I guess? if your table even uses that rule. The problem is all these things are done so much better by the observant feat, which gives you a plus five to your passive perception and investigation, a plus one to your stats, and has a cool roleplay lip reading thing. Dungeon Delver harkens back to a simpler time, when D&D was just a way for one kid to bully four other kids by running them through a certain death dungeon and pretending that it was fair. It was a fun time, sure, but the game has moved on, and most parties never even do traditional dungeon crawls. Sharpshooter and Great Weapon Master 
I'm clumping these two together, because they're basically the same level of insanity. Great Weapon Master works with heavy weapons, like the Greatsword, and Sharpshooter works for ranged weapons, including thrown weapons, interestingly. Both feats share the same ability, that when you make an attack roll, you can take a minus 5 on that attack, and if you hit, you deal an additional 10 damage. That's a lot of damage. If you can reliably get advantage on your attacks, like a Reckless Barbarian or a Samurai Fighter, that minus 5 is basically nullified. So these feats pretty much double your damage output, but that's not all. Sharpshooter lets you shoot at long range without disadvantage and ignore three quarters and half cover. You can be sniping people from 600 feet away. Great Weapon Master lets you attack again as a bonus action whenever you crit or kill a creature. And with all the extra damage you're throwing out, you're gonna be killing a lot of creatures. These feats are so good that any build that can take them and doesn't is just strictly making itself worse. They're probably broken, actually, which is why martial characters love them. Grappler. Grappler is the worst feat in the game, not only because it's terrible, but because it lies to you. For a start, this piece of trash has the gall to demand that you have 13 in strength before you can even take it. Then it gives you the first benefit. You have advantage on attacks against creatures you are grappling. Very niche, but whatever. Benefit number two, you can use an action, yes, an entire action, to attempt to pin a creature that you are grappling. If you succeed, both you and the creature are restrained, meaning both of you can't move, both of you have disadvantage on all attacks, and both of you have all incoming attacks made at advantage. You just took an entire action to nerf yourself, when what you could have done is just used one of your attacks to push the target prone. Now the creature is prone, everybody has advantage on melee attack rolls against them, and all their attacks have disadvantage. The only difference here is that it costs you less time to do, it's better, and you didn't also screw yourself over by doing it. This pin move is terrible, and the only effect it has is to trick new players into being worse by doing it. The grappler feat makes you a worse grappler. It's not even the best grappling feat. If you want to grapple, Tavern Brawler is a great choice, letting you attempt to grapple as a bonus action. That's actually a pretty decent feat. I'd say friends don't let friends take the grappler feat, but hell, I wouldn't even let an enemy take this. Lucky. You all saw this coming. Lucky is both very simple and very simply way too strong. Anytime you make an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you can spend one of your three luck points per day to roll an additional d20 and take the highest of all the results. You can do this retroactively, after you've rolled and seen the results, and it stacks with advantage. So if you're already rolling 2d20, you're now rolling 3. If you have elven accuracy, you're now rolling 4. You can even use this defensively to get enemies re-rolling their attack rolls against you. If you get hit by an incoming crit, just use the lucky feet and they have to re-roll. People hate on silvery barbs for doing this, but Lucky's been doing it for years. But the most broken application of the feat comes down to how it's actually worded. Lucky says whenever you use a luck point, you roll one extra d20 and take the highest of all the d20s you roll. So if you attack at disadvantage, maybe by blindfolding yourself first, you're rolling 2d20 and keeping the lowest. But then you spend a luck point, roll an additional d20, and you take the highest of all three rolls. You've turned disadvantage into super advantage. And this isn't just like a loophole, this was actively intended by the designers. Lucky is an amazing defensive tool. If you want to get cheesy, it's an absolutely unparalleled offensive tool, and you can use it to brute force your way through social encounters by re-rolling key persuasion or deception checks. This this is the best feat in the game. Every build is better if they have this, and that's why it is by far the most banned. If you want more feats and you want to support the channel, swing on by Patreon. I make a full magazine there every month for everyone who subscribes. If this channel's videos are worth even $3 a month to you, consider supporting on there to help make them and get some awesome rewards. And yeah, that's all I got. Remember to like and subscribe, check out other videos on the channel, and I'll see you next time.